Hi guys, Toby Mathis here from Anderson Business Advisors. And I want to talk to you today about a topic. I mean, there's controversial topics, and this is one huge one when it comes to personal finance and even company finance. And that is whether there's ever such thing as good debt. And now here's the reality. The reality is that there's folks out there that'll say to have zero debt and you're going to be better off eat rice and beans or something like that and skimp and save and never incur any debt because debt makes you a slave. I get that. They're wrong. Then there's the other folks that say leverage is everything you want to leverage. You want If you're going to go to school, get student loans because it's going to pay itself off. They are wrong. The answer is always going to be is a it depends. And I always think of this old adage, and I heard Warren Buffett talking about this once. It's this, the old adage was a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. And he kind of says, that's a good start, but you really should look at a, a, at the time horizon. What am I give, giving up versus what am I receiving? So for example, if you have children and they're going to be going to school and you say, hey, I want them to go get a college education, not all degrees are worth the same. Would I incur half a million dollars of debt to become an English major? No. Would I incur half a million dollars of debt to become a doctor, a medical doctor? Yeah, probably, because one is worth astronomically, is worth astronomically more than the other. And so it really comes down to is what am I giving up? If I'm putting myself in debt, am I getting an asset in return? And the easiest way to look at this is an asset feeds you. An asset puts money in your pocket and you got to figure out how much money. So again, if I'm, if I'm doing the, the college thing, I'm looking at how much more money is it going to put in my pocket than if I did nothing? How much is that debt going to cost me? Is it 30%? Is it 5%? Is it 1%? All of those are part of the equation. So if you run across someone who says, you should never have debt ever, if it's really horrible. Okay, maybe in the personal realm for consumables. But if I am buying a house that is going to pay me money and the house literally pays off the debt and puts money in my pocket every month, I'm going to say that that's actually a pretty good scenario. And I'm much more likely going to go do that versus here's a debt. It's 7% interest. It's $100,000. And it's going to allow me to get a degree that is not going to impact my earning capacity at all. In fact, it may actually decrease it. That is not a good thing. Same token is let's say I'm going into California and I want to be a real estate investor. And so I find a duplex in San Francisco for $2 million. And somebody says, this is a great deal. Values are going up. And so I go out and I pull and I get debt to do this. Let's say I get $2 million worth of debt at 4%. Now you feel like a big winner because you're thinking this is a great market. Guess what? Markets go up and down everywhere in the country. Historically, they average about a 4% increase nationally on real estate. If I am paying that, I am not getting anything for my money. In fact, there is zero that I'm receiving. And more likely than not, that property, depending on what kind of rents I can get, is not going to be enough to pay for that debt, which means I am bleeding every month to buy that property. That is not a good situation. I would not do that. What I would be looking at is, will the property in, or the, will the asset pay for any debt and still put money in my pocket? So for example, let's say a same scenario, but instead of buying a $2 million duplex in San Francisco, I'm buying a $2 million building in Ohio. And let's say that $2 million building every year after the debt service, after it pays off the debt, still puts $100,000 in my pocket. So it pays for itself, plus I get $100,000. I'm taking that action. I'm taking that action all day long. And somebody says, oh, you shouldn't be indebted. You should always calculate it and you should actually calculate in in a a degree of error. You're looking at vacancy rates, you're looking at worst case scenarios, and you're putting yourself in a scenario to where you can take that debt and you can actually make more money. Going back to our doctor scenario, what if it costs me $200,000 to get a medical degree, but that medical degree is going to increase my lifetime earnings by $5 million? And I'm not you know, being crazy on some of these numbers. It'll literally take you from, you know, a typical college degree is supposed to give you a lifetime earnings 
on average of about a million dollars more. Well, that's an average, which means there's some that pay less and there's some that pay more. I'm telling you, the English majors are subsidizing all the medical degrees and the engineers and the, do- and the lawyers out there. There's certain degrees that are worth substantially more than others. And you should be factoring that into your equation when you're deciding what type of debt to give, you know, whether or not it makes sense. So we go back again to that bird in the hand worth is two in the bush. All right. What am I giving up? Am I giving up a bird and I'm getting back a half a bird, which is a horrible scenario, right? Let's just, let's just, let's just say, am I giving up more than what am I, am, that I'm receiving? Or is that bird is, and I'm getting two birds, but that two birds is over a 30 year horizon that I'm not getting much of a return on that, on that. I should be looking at all of those equations to determine whether or not it's something I should be incurring. Now that said, you should start realizing that a liability, the debt is a liability. A debt bleeds you. A debt takes money out. That the only time you should be using liabilities is to acquire something that's paying you money, which means you don't use debt to buy your clothes. You don't use debt uh, unless it's like a uniform or a suit, like, and you need it to be a, an actor, an actress, or maybe a lawyer. So you're going to court or whatever. But th- with very few exceptions, you don't use personal consumables and use debt to buy it. It's a recipe for disaster. And so when you hear people start talking about having zero debt, a lot of times I say personal credit cards. Absolutely. You can have them, but they're for emergencies. Don't get used to using them. And you absolutely don't want to buy a liability like a car with a loan that is also a liability. So the car costs me money plus the loan costs me money. The next thing I realize is that I am a slave to that vehicle. I'm having to work for that vehicle. The much better scenario is to have something that is providing you income to pay for that vehicle. So if I buy an asset, so I'll I'll use the example of buying a rental property. Let's say that I'm looking around and I'm trying to find something that's generating positive income and I'm actually going to use a loan to get it, but it's giving me a positive income stream of $500 a month. I would budget that $500 a month towards my vehicle. In other words, if I'm going to go ahead and get debt for the vehicle, I don't want to have to work to pay for that debt. I want to have an asset pay for that debt. And the most successful people that I have seen, and I've been doing this for over 20 years, we do over 6,000 tax returns every year for nothing but business owners and investors. I know who makes money. I know who doesn't. The most successful people buy assets that pay for their liabilities. So if you're going to have debt and you have an asset paying for it, that's okay. If you're going to buy a Lamborghini, but you have an asset that's paying for it, that's okay. What's not okay is you going out and getting into debt up to your eyeballs so that you're working to pay off that debt constantly. Now that brings us squarely to the question of your personal residence. Your personal residence, is is it an asset or is it a liability? The easiest way to look at this is, does your home cost you money every month or does it put money in your pocket? If you're like 99.99% of the folks out there, your home is costing you money. The only exception is when you have like a duplex and you're renting out a half or your house hacking and you have a bunch of roommates that you're renting to. Otherwise, if you're like normal folks that are just buying a house and that's where their family lives, it's a liability. And it's pulling money out of your pocket. And then you go out and you get a loan on that. So you're buying a liability with a liability. And you wonder why you start having problems. It's because you are in this, I call it the losing loop, where you're working to pay off a liability and it's a vicious cycle. You're working to pay off the interest that is working that that you use to buy another liability that is your home. And so you have two exiting things. We have two liabilities that are pulling money out of our pocket. We have the house that's pulling money out of our pocket and we have the loan that's pulling money out of our pocket. So it's critical that we extinguish that loan or that we get assets that pay for that loan. And so I'll give you an example. When I moved down to Las uh, to Las Vegas in 2007, I came from Seattle and I moved down to Las Vegas to run our offices down here. We have three offices here in Las Vegas. When I did that, I looked at the, the Las Vegas market. This was before the depression or the recession, however you want to categorize it. This was before the economy just went off the cliff. It was before Las Vegas homes lost 75% of their value on average. So I was looking at properties and I still remember this to this day. To buy a house in the neighborhood where I wanted my kids to go to school, 
I was going to have to put a down payment of about $200,000 down on these. And these were million dollar houses. Everything was way ramped up. And I said, there's no way in heck I'm going to pay that. I could rent that same house for $3,000 a month. And so, you know what I did? I said, hey, that's my cost of living is $3,000 a month. That's what I'm willing to, to, to do for a house, to be in this neighborhood, great neighborhood, beautiful houses, great neighbors, all these things, great schools. This is what I wanted. So I took the $200,000 that would have been a down payment and I bought multiple rental properties. I actually bought three rental properties in the Las Vegas area. And those properties provide rents. And those rents, you use that rent to pay for your rent. And guess how much money I'm coming out of pocket every month? I had about, a, it was right, let's just say it was $3,000 a month coming in and it was $3,000 a month was my lease payment. I was at a zero. In other words, I had an asset that was paying for my liability. Had I purchased that home, I would have been paying not only would I have been paying the property tax, not only would I have been paying for the mortgage interest on that loan, which would have been sizable, significant. I would have been paying for all the upkeep and everything else, but I would also have been at risk for when it took its dive. And that property lost over half its value. None of that occurred and I wasn't even, you know, exiting money out of my pocket every month. I was just sitting there looking at it going, wow, this economy is really shifting. That's horrible, but it wasn't beating the snot out of me. Had I done what everybody else did and leveraged myself into a property that I couldn't have afforded, then it would have been a really bad situation. I'm not going to say that I've never done that or that I've never made mistakes. I absolutely have. Anybody who's been in real estate has made mistakes. It's how you learn from them. And one of the things that I learned there was when you are when you're using debt, you want to make sure that you have assets that are paying for those liabilities. Now, let's say that you're already in debt. I have a bunch of credit card debt. I have a bunch of house debt. What should I do? So here's the easiest thing to do. And I'm just going to do this mathematically. And there's lots of folks out there. There's the Dame, Dave Ramsey's, the Danny Johnson, the world's, that teach how to attack debt. And I'm just going to make it mathematical for you. In my world, I always look at the highest interest rates and I say, how much is it costing me? Whichever one's costing me the most, those dollars that cost me the most, I'm going to pay back the soonest. So if I have two loans, one's a 0% 12, in, 12 month loan that's on a credit card or something like that, an introductory rate or something versus I have a 30% credit card and I have $1,000 on each. I'm going to pay the $1,000 that's at 30% before I pay the $1,000 that's at zero. A lot of these folks will just, you know, start just attacking them willy nilly and they're not really looking at it. The other thing I look at is debt for student debt. For example, I can never bankrupt. I can never get away from it. So I may be wanting to pay off some of my student debt before some of my other debts that I could extinguish if there was a, if like I had a major illness or something. And I had massive uh, medical bills or something like that, which is the leading cause of bankruptcy, by the way, is medical expenses and, and health expenses that you're not able to pay. If that occurred, I'd still be able to get away from my consumer debt. So I might be attacking the type of debt that I can't get rid of first. The other thing I look at, and like, let's just say it's mortgage debt. And it's mortgage debt that I can deduct and it exceeds my standard deduction with everything else. And I'm getting a tax deduction every year for it. Maybe I'm not paying that one first. Maybe I'm paying my credit cards that I get no deduction for. I cannot write off the interest I'm paying. Maybe I want to get rid of that debt first. All of those are factors. And so if anybody ever tells you, oh, this is the only way to do it. There's one way to do it. They're absolutely full of poo poo. They're absolutely full of it. There's no way they know without actually breaking it down. And different types of debt are treated differently. Even more importantly, certain types of debt are really tough to get. Like if I have portfolio loans on real estate, they're really tough to get. Maybe I don't pay, pay, pay that one off right away. If I'm comparing paying off a house or or, or paying off a portfolio loan, it might be easier to get to get this loan. So maybe I wipe it out first. Because I know if I get into an emergency situation and I need capital to avoid a, a horrible situation that I can go get loans on this. Or let's say if I pay off my credit card debt, I don't just cut up the credit card. I might freeze it in a block of ice so I can't get to it, but I'm not going to destroy that credit card. I want to keep access to those funds. So if I do have an emergency, that I do have access to capital. And that's how you end up breaking it down is I attack the debt that's most costly. 
a lot of times people have access to money they don't even realize. So for example, I had a client in Seattle and he and his wife each had IRAs. They were, they were rollovers from a 401k from a previous employer. So they both worked. They ended up leaving the employer and starting their own business. And they had, uh, I remember the wife had $130,000 in her IRA and he had like 90,000 in his. And they had credit card debt of $70,000 in their startup. And I looked at him and I said, why are you paying all this interest to these credit card companies? And they're like, oh, he couldn't get a loan for anything else. I said, hold on for a second. I said, you have money in a retirement plan. Now you can't borrow from an IRA, but you, but you have your own business. Just set up your own 401k, roll the money into there. You can borrow up to $50,000 each from your plan. Well, in his case, it's up to 50% of the money. So he could borrow 45,000. His wife could borrow 50,000 because she had 130,000. He had 90. So he could borrow half of the 90. But either case, they could borrow enough to pay off all of their consumer credit card debt. That average was 11% a year that they were paying on that consumer credit card debt. When they paid it off, they rolled it into a 401k, borrowed the money. Now they pay themselves the interest and it's a really small interest amount. At that time, it was about 3%. So they paid themselves the interest. They eliminated 11% interest payment on $70,000, which if you can do the math, I'm not going to figure the compounding, but just say it's, it's somewhere around $8,000 a year that they save immediately. They still have the same amount of debt. It's just, it's different. They're paying themselves. If you have a uh, whole life insurance, or if you have indexed universal life insurance, or you have a uh, IRA or a 401k, these types of things, you can borrow off of those assets. Here's another fun one. You can actually use your uh, stock account. Let's say I have a bunch of stock uh, in Microsoft, or IBM, or some blue chip portfolios, or I work for an employer's things. A lot of folks don't realize that could be used as collateral for debt. And if you have collateral for debt, it's much cheaper than if you don't. So if I go to a credit card company and I say, hey, I need to get a, I, I want to use money from the credit card company, they're going to charge me quite often. It's going to be around 10%. I think the average is 13% nationally. So let's just call it 10%. They're going to charge you at least double digits because it's not sitting here being secured. But if I use my stock portfolio and I go to my stock broker and I say, hey, do you guys have security back line of credit? Do you guys have something where you can loan me money based on this portfolio that you know I have here? They will do that. And it's generally speaking, it's super cheap. It used to be like 75 basis points over LIBOR. It was quite literally two and 3% during, during all the nastiness that was going on during our recession. And you could actually get that money and pay off these high interest credit cards. Whoa. Now, all of a sudden, I'm getting myself away from these usurious rates and these predatory lenders that are, and I'm, I'm not going to say anything bad, like against the visas and the MasterCards of the world, but quite often you're paying really high interest rates when I have the ability to get a very low interest rate. Now, a lot of you guys look at your house loan and you say, well, that's really low interest rate. Why would I want to pay that off earlier? I, I agree with you. I would actually create a list from my car loans to everything else. And I would say, hey, if I have any debt, I want to see what I'm paying and I want to attack certain types of debt first. And I, especially the high interest ones. If I'm paying more than 10% on, a, uh, on money, I'm going to attack it rapidly to get rid of it. And even if I have to borrow out of uh, another asset. So for example, you, people used to get the home equity lines of credit, send their kids to school and things like that. Now, I wouldn't necessarily do that because that's not deductible anymore but it's still cheaper. So all things being equal, let's say I get a HELOC on my house and it's at 4%. That's much better than using 13% money on my, on my visa or going out and getting a student loan at 7% or something like that. I might still be able to get cheaper money. So that's kind of the, the truth about debt is it's not all created equal. There are no one size fits alls for everybody. You actually have to do the math. And if, and if anytime you're questioning, if the first thing you ask yourself is, am I getting debt on a liability? And a liability, real simple, it costs you money every month, or is it an asset that brings in money? If I have debt on an asset, does the amount that the asset brings in cover all of the debt and still give me some cushion? If the answer is yet, then that's probably good debt. If it's not that, then it's probably not. Now, the only other thing you look at is the old bird in the hand versus two in the bush. And if you are taking out debt on something that's going to be significantly more valuable in the future, for example, a medical degree, engineering degree, something, a legal degree, something along those lines, 
where you can definitely say, if I incur this debt, it's going to pay me off three or four times the amount that it's costing me. That everything else is probably not good debt. But if it falls into that category, then it's probably going to be worth it. And when you have somebody say, never, ever, ever, ever get into debt, they're just not quite thinking of it, that there is such thing as positive debt. It's just that you have to do the math and you have to go in with your why, with, with your eyes open. Last little tip for those of you guys who have mortgages. A lot of times they're talking about 15 year mortgage or, hey, what if I double up payments? Here's the truth on mortgages. You always have to be wary of prepayment penalties if you pay off too much interest. But these these financial instruments are created to front load most of the interest. And so the first few years of a mortgage, generally speaking, you're getting a nice deduction for it, but you're paying mostly interest. But if you just did an extra payment, like if you went biweekly instead of every month, or if you just made an extra payment every quarter, just four extra payments a year, you'd literally cut the payment stream You'd cut a 30 year loan in, you'd, you'd cut it to, a, I think it's 19 years. I forget the math exactly on it, but it's, I think it shaves off 11 years if you just did extra quarterly payments. If you can't do quarterly payments, just do one extra year, something like that, or just kick an extra 50 bucks, whatever it is, you just start doing it. You can actually pencil out the math and see what it saves you. If you can. The best route is to say, hey, that debt's okay. As long as I'm taking my money and I'm investing in something that's returning a greater return than that debt is costing me. So again, if I have a 4% interest rate on a mortgage, but I have pieces of property that are generating 10% a year, yeah, I'll keep that debt. That's okay because I'm getting way more off of my leverage than it's costing me. And that's the old bird in the hand, two in the bush. And it comes down to just simple math and it's doing the calculation. So I hope this helps. This is the truth on debt. There is good debt. And there is bad debt. And the problem in our country is that we are marketed that bad debt day and night, all day long, because somebody else is looking at it saying they're using debt to actually give you that debt. They're borrowing it from somebody else, like at a bank. They're using your checking and they're paying you very little on that savings account that you have. And they're loaning it out at a much higher route. They have debt. They're making money off of it. That's called good debt. Bad debt is when it's costing you more than you're ever going to hope to re- receive it, uh, 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 you know, in, in exchange. And again, if I was going to leave you with one little final adage, you'd be like, well, if, what if I could borrow money all day long out at 10% and I'm paying somebody 10%, but I could loan it out at 5%. Would you ever do that? Heck no. That's just crazy. That's insanity. But we do it every day because we don't actually track our numbers. We, but if we flip that around, would you pay 5% so that you could make 10% on it? Absolutely then you become the bank. And that's good debt. And I hope that makes sense to you. And and with all things, uh, whenever I start talking taxes or anything financial, I always say that there's three rules. It's calculate, calculate, and calculate. It's pretty simple. Get your pencil out. And you can usually figure that thing out in about five minutes. Hope this is helpful. 